So now, okay, subtleties of coordination. Well, some of you will have seen a previous lecture I gave. Um, this is very much the same subject, but I've uh, now sorted out a lot more of the details. So I think in a way, I'm in a position to say I really know how this works, how coordination works um, to produce amazing results like language. Well, we'll see. Okay, uh, just first I'd like to, um, uh, yeah, thank uh, main people I've uh, in, been introduced by is um, Scott Kelslow, who's here, who has this idea of coordination dynamics, and Alexa Yardley. I'll uh, say about my interactions with her when I come to it near the end, but she has this interesting concept of circular theory, and we've been, um, uh, well, we talked a bit about it, and I, it's got in her book. Anyway, let me get on. Um, okay, uh, now, for people interested in seeing the previous talk who are not members of this group, it's at that link on our uh, media service, or you can go to the top of my homepage and there's a link, uh, videos and audios, which um, this set of videos, and that's one of them. There's also an open access paper. I have a link to it from my homepage, The Physics of Mind and Thought. So if people want to um, look at the uh, previous versions of this, that's where you can go. Um, okay, now as before, I'm going to um, really talk about why, we, why it would be good to have a new kind of theory of, uh, of the universe and everything. So I'm going to compare past theories, um, distant past, uh, say Newtonian mechanics and Maxwell's electromagnetism. Compare that with quantum mechanics, which is a standard explanation which took over more than a century ago. Okay, well, uh, okay, first thing is that these previous theories dealt with clearly real entities. Newtonian mechanics dealt with things like um, objects and um, acceleration forces, which seem to be uh, clear enough. Maxwell dealt with electric and magnetic fields, which you can measure directly. And quantum mechanics is a lot more subtle than that. So it's a different kind of theory and people are not even too sure how to interpret it. Also, Newton and Maxwell had theories of everything, to use today's phrase. Um, like Maxwell would explain all electromagnetic phenomena. Uh, people thought they were heading to that when there was some, um, uh, let me see, a standard model. Uh, but unfortunately, they, there were problems linking that with gravity. So that's a difference. We no longer get a nice specific theory that works. Also, uh, quantum mechanics could only predict statistics. Um, unlike um, uh, Newtonian mechanics and Maxwell's electromagnetism, which dealt with specific cases. So today's theory was not as good in that respect. And then there's a problem of many worlds. Again, people are not too sure how to um, deal with that. Of course, uh, Newton and Maxwell, their uh, theories dealt only with a single world. Okay, so all sorts of difficulties with today's uh, ideal quantum mechanics. So can we do better? Which has been my aim for a long time. Well, as I pointed out earlier, um, we should perhaps think in terms of biological terms. In terms, of, well, in, think biologically. And something that supports that is the fact that there are of interesting parallels between quantum mechanics and biology. Um, I and uh, my colleagues wrote this up in a uh, paper, uh, A Realist Psychobiological Interpretation of Reality, which you can see on the archive. Karen Barrett had a somewhat similar idea in her book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, that um, uh, well, what she did was to explore parallels between 
quantum mechanics and um, sort of social systems, how people interact, which was coordination in a way. Okay, so how would that work? Um, well, uh, it's interesting to note that in some ways, how what physicists do and what biologists do are uh, as like as chalk and cheese. Uh, what's the difference? Well, physics is centered around calculation. Your goal is to be able to calculate a property, put in the numbers and the equations and get out the results. Biology, on the other hand, is more like um, asking what is going on. Uh, a very uh, current illustration is the question of how is a virus transmitted? Uh, we want to know what is going on with the coronavirus because that is, um, helps us decide what to do. So no, it's, it's just a scientific, but it doesn't, um, calculation is not so important. It has a minor role, but we don't um, deal with exact equations. No numbers do come in to some extent. Okay. Uh, however, I should point out that uh, it's very relevant that sometimes in physics we can find out what is going on. Uh, I've got two examples here, Brownian motion and X-ray diffraction. Brownian motion is a motion of a particle in a fluid. It moves about and you can sort of deal with the mathematics as Einstein did. Um, the, um, but we know it. What's really going on is atoms are colliding with the object and making it move. X-ray diffraction, we know that what's going on there is there's a crystal structure. But what we, so what we want to know really is what's going on in this mysterious quantum realm. And that's the aim of this project. As I said, a major part is the concept of coordination. And um, coordination involves things called synergies. So in biology, we find systems working together to act as a unit. Uh, I'll uh, elaborate on that in a moment. But this, this synergies were first uh, noted in physics, actually. But the difference in biology is we have complex hierarchical structures. So I'll show one here. Uh, the numbers aren't important. Um, and I did a search for uh, trees and um, found this in Wikipedia, so it saved me a lot of work just being able to take this diagram I could talk about. Anyway, I might as well refer to the numbers. Uh, so systems working together as a unit. We have here, say, uh, objects five and so objects seven and five work together to produce two. Now, uh, let's be a little vigorous about this. Um, we can say a synergy involves a mode of behavior. You can sort of point to it and say, this is a, this is a particular kind of behavior. Uh, you can study this uh, experimentally, um, like look at things happening on the brain and you see, oh, this is uh, something rather specific that's happening. You can describe it by an equation. You can model um, the way these work together uh, by, um, uh, well, mathematical models. So in other words, it's quite like physics, but more complicated. Next point is that we can describe this hierarchical situation uh, from a bottom-up and a top-down perspective. What I mean is we can say um, seven and five work together these two processes produce process two. Now we could look at it the other way around, and of course this happens at many levels. Um, two, ten, and six produce process seven. We can equally say the cause of process two is seven and five. And the important thing is uh, this wouldn't happen by chance. There are specific mechanisms which give rise to synergies, generally involving feedback. So in other words, something is trying to cause this coordination to take place, um, to perform adjustments, uh, partly trial and error, partly feedback from what, how it behaves, trying to get a nice synergy. 
Okay, so that again you can treat mathematically. Now uh, I should say I didn't put it here. But Kelso has a, um, uh, a book article actually on um, uh, on coordination dynamics. I think if you search for it on Research Gate, you'll find a uh, a version you can download. And uh, when you look into it, you find um, uh, you've got both. Uh, top down and bottom up working. Sometimes you get a stable situation. Sometimes it's metastable, um, and so uh, it's um, sometimes there, sometimes not there, depending on conditions. You find that it may switch from some situation to another. Um, as things re rearrange, if they're, well, if they're unstable, then they may split up and arrange in different ways. And uh, I think it's important, oops, is uh, disruption. Uh, you can say uh, there's a sort of uh, clash between tendency for things to work together and a force with, and a disruptive force. If you just wham the system, then you might um, find the system splits up and doesn't go back. And what disruption does, that's important, is it will get rid of unsuitable combinations. So in other words, uh, if you have the right kind of mechanisms, then uh, you will have, um, you'll get good combinations. And I uh, want to explain how this works. And uh, my example is language, which I talked a bit about in the previous talk. Well, the nice thing about language is that we can, um, find out quite a bit of detail. We don't have to uh, probe with, um, put probes into the brain to see what's happening. Um, we can look at language, see what it's doing. Um, and we see there are many examples of coordination. Uh, just to give two examples, uh, people may want to work together, so they talk to each other, they say a bit up to the left, yeah, now a bit to the right. Uh, so one person who can see the thing tells the other person what to do. So you get an outcome. Uh, the two behaviors work together to produce the outcome. Uh, something a bit similar is when you follow instructions. Um, that's, um, well, there you've got a, a system. The, um, the, well, the language is coordinating with what you're doing. Okay. Another example in language is that um, bits of language, chunks of language, can be seen to be working together. Standard example, uh, noun and verb, will say, do a particular thing with this object. Um, so here you see two bits of language working together. If somebody has said one thing, it would be no good. If somebody said the activity, that would be no good. The language puts the two together. And uh, you can look and see many instances at work. Uh, so you could study it this way, but the thing that I think is um, crucial and probably not many people have noticed this, is that there's a computer simulation which has many details. Um, Winograd thought about how language works and wrote some um, converted such ideas into software. And uh, he talked about how it was done, and you can see this in terms of synergies, um, like the various functions defined in the program are like synergies. But what uh, what the program does is you um, it works in a uh, in a simulated blocks world, so you can check that the language is being interpreted correctly. So the first thing was uh, pick up a big red block. And the, uh, the imaginary world was set up with a red block in it, and there, were, there was a program which could move the block, uh, including picking it up. And the program, lo and behold, did that. So how does it work? Well, the main thing to say, uh, the general idea is that there are various experts that are active in response to the input. The experts in grammar and in um, 
interpreting what's what the words mean, for example. Uh, and what they end up doing is to make a synergy. They don't do things directly. You don't, uh, and sometimes you can respond directly to what someone says, but usually you have to think about what it means and then you can do it. So the program has to work that way. Uh, so these experts work away on the input and they create a synergy and the synergy is what does things. Um, and uh, in the program, it creates code that can be run by a, a planning program. Okay, so let's have a look at that. Uh, we built a, st a structure as in the diagram um, on the basis that the experts work away and they um, are generating a structure uh, which is like a, a good program with some things calling other things, things that work together. Then you sort of say run if it's a command, something to do now, and that performs the action. Uh, one thing before I go on is that, um, which will turn out to be important, is, is each expert I talk about were programmed to take into account language specific cues. Uh, Winograd used a particular grammar called functional grammar that didn't just look at the syntax and say these are the rules for structure. Uh, this functional grammar uh, figures out what particular structures do, which is what you want for programming. Okay. Now, next thing is, uh, I've talked about what um, the program is doing. Uh, of course, the program does things in a very different way to the brain. So we have to postulate as, as a physical mechanism that's doing it, mechanism in the brain. Well, that's very interesting. I don't know how much uh, people have worked on this. And I suppose the kind of models that uh, Scott deals with uh, go some way towards us. I think you could probably work out the details that way. But anyway, we, we're used to mechanisms doing things like switches have a specific effect. Um, Tune circuits have a specific effect. They can be used to there's something with two components, a capacitor and inductor, and you, you turn a knob and that lets you tune into a particular program. So this is a really physical thing, um, a familiar thing, that some physical mechanism can do interesting things. Uh, well, what would be involved, um, I would think it would be nonlinear dynamics, some dynamical process. And as I said, the programs, um, recognize features of grammar. So the way the instantiation of this program, the brain has got to work is that um, they're kind of markers. So the program marks a structure saying this is a noun phrase. So in a way, uh, we language users know about noun phrases. There's implicit knowledge. This has to be marked in some way. Uh, some particular kind of activity. Uh, this is something not unfamiliar uh, in brain research. Particular kinds of dynamical systems work with particular processes like walking. So this is something we can imagine could be studied in detail. So, uh, okay, now the question is how does this all happen? Um, well, it's the Q is what mechanism, finding mechanisms that do useful things. So we can say over time, over evolution and uh, in the language development of the original, useful things are discovered uh, uh, working with the environment. Like for example, we may be confronted with a ladder and we have to figure out how to climb it. So we figure out a particular mechanism for doing that a program that can be called upon. Now, I'm going to remind you again of stability versus disruption. 
I've said that we, uh, we imagine a system that looks to see if, how it can combine things to do something. And as I said earlier, what matters is whether um, what you build can cause disruption or not. Most of your, it's a bit like trial and error. Uh, most of your trials just produce a mess. So you can imagine this is disruption your new thing will just disintegrate. But sometimes uh, you think, aha, it works. It actually gets me to something useful. And then you get a system which is potentially stable. So this seems to be a, a crucial part of the explanation. Just very few uh, mechanisms will work and a system can get more and more complicated because more and more devices are produced and so we get these ensembles of devices language understanding is a collection of these devices working together that may sound implausible until we recognize that Winograd's program actually does this so okay uh, now I want to put these all these bits together into an overall picture which is my theory as to how um, uh, how language works and more generally how biology and mind works. So as I just said there's a at a given time there's a collection of devices and they start off very, in a very simple way. Some stable, some metastable. Metastability means it can adjust to the context. And the only new mechanisms uh, that can add to the system are those which will not disrupt the existing order just because they can do things isn't enough. So there's some special kind of constraint. Now you might, if somebody said, uh, uh, this is how it works, you might think, hmm, it, uh, I don't believe it. Uh, I don't believe that such a, a structure would work where all the things work nicely together, but we know they do. So in other words, uh, these combinations of structures, all these synergies, working together. Um, sometimes it all works and nature takes advantage of this. It, uh, uh, organism hunts hunt around and they find a little bit of extra. I just mentioned two ideas in Kaufman's book, A World Beyond Physics. Um, he's talking about the same general picture. Uh, there are two ideas. One, uh, constraint closure. Uh, what I do is you you have a well these processes are as we were constraining what can happen it's not we don't act randomly we have processes which do specific things and uh, a closed structure results to some extent closed the language system just does a certain set of things all these um, you don't get an indefinitely large system, that, that sort of helps. Uh, and there's another idea of adjacent possible. Well, I just mentioned this, that um, if you have some structure that works, there's something which is sufficiently near to it that you can find it in a search. So these are two bits of the overall picture. Okay, well, let's take it that we uh, can explain language. Now I'd like to show how what's involved in explaining mind. Um, I did mention this previously, but I'll describe it in these terms. Uh, language is clearly, well, okay, mentality. Mental domain is thinking, basically, and um, uh, building up mental pictures of various kinds. Language plays an essential part. You could say language constrains what we think about. We, um, we can go just randomly thinking, but then we, when we put our thoughts into words, we're pinning down the possibilities. Well, then there's a whole world um, and uh, various devices. And one thing I'll uh, mention again, that there are different ways um, uh, let's see, um, 
uh, yes, Peirce was responsible for sign theory. And he talked about three kinds of signs, uh, iconic, indexical, and um, uh, symbolic. Uh, and uh, the point is, indexical use of signs is when we use them to index things in our environments. Like we may give a name, we may see a cat, we give it a name, cat. That allows us to talk about cats. Uh, the difference with symbolic use of language is that you can use it uh, to talk about situations that are not, not present. So that would involve new devices specifically related to this kind of thing. And some of these devices will make use of abstract thought. What I claim is this is a general picture which one could develop in detail by, um, by sort of trying models and seeing how they work, which explains both um, language and thought and knowledge and all these sort of things. So we have something which uh, might form a basis, a new kind of basis for physics. So uh, let's get back to fundamentals. Well, I already said there are some parallels which suggest um, that we can go from biology to physics, or biology has something to say about physics. And this idea is consistent with something I didn't mention, that's Wheeler's idea of participatory universe. And in a moment I'll give a quote from a uh, paper by Mayer, uh, which shows how this might work. So, okay, the title of this paper was The Universe as a Cyclic Organised Information System, which is not so different from what I've been talking about. It's organised, um, cyclic, I'm not sure its meaning, but at least you go back and forth between one, one system and another to keep it going. So, Anyway, what he's suggesting is um, reality grows out of the act of observation and thus consciousness itself, it is participatory. Uh, Wheeler's idea of quantum mechanics is that we don't just observe the universe as um, in classical mechanics. Our observa observation changes the universe in classical mechanics. So in some way we're participating in reality and um, we, uh, uh, if we observe in the right way, we might synthesize something. So he's saying information, because this uses information, is the most fundamental building block of reality, and the universe should be seen as self-synthesized information, a self-synthesized information system. A self-excited circuit that is developing for a closed loop cycle. Uh, well, that's pretty well what I've been talking about in this lecture. So uh, that's another piece of a puzzle, as it were. Um, he talked about how laws would develop in this way. Of course, biological systems give rise to lawful behaviour. Uh, the existence of symbolisms is a way we create laws, we express laws, and then we laws at work, and then we uh, insist that the laws are obeyed. So uh, in this picture, we wouldn't have fixed laws. We aren't discovering laws of nature, universal laws of nature. We're discovering what em has emerged through some mechanisms. Okay, and uh, yet another approach I want to talk about is Yardley's circular theory. Well, this is a strange story. Uh, uh, she contacted me more than 10 years ago, maybe 2007 we first met. Uh, she wrote a book who claims that I helped to put her ideas in order. The ideas are rather strange and um, you can see some sort of sense to them. But as I've been developing myself, I can see that her ideas actually closely parallel, parallel the present discussion of mind and thought. So in other words, what she's saying happening is pretty well the same as what I've just been saying happening and what Wheeler's saying is happening. But the extra thing is that there's a basic act of a, a circle. Uh, movements of this circle 
are the source of everything. So we have objects, circles, uh, movements, the uh, what circles do, they circle, and you make more and more circles. Uh, circles in particular make one thing from two and two from one. And that doesn't sound awfully convincing. You, you would think, and I thought until recently, well, why should this produce a sensible kind of thing? And I have this idea that um, most things you produce are disruptive. It now makes a lot more sense. So you can say that um, really uh, dynamics, perhaps turbulence, is producing something like our um, uh, our universe. And in this connection, there are two things. I don't think I have a slide here. Um, oh, I'll just mention that she talks about articulation as part of a creative process. Well, of course, um, that's part of how ideas get expressed. We have uh, signs, um, kind of movements. Well, uh, ideas get expressed because we can articulate them. And uh, in fact, mind is the omnipresent background, which we know only for the symbols. So it all fits together in a way. But what I also want to say is connection between two um, ideas. One is it's becoming apparent that in some situations, strange things happen in fluid dynamics, things that parallel what happens in the quantum world. That's consistent with this idea. Also a thing I mentioned previously, somatics, which is a process where you uh, activate water in particular ways and you get interesting structures. So really it all fits together. So I think I can claim that this is uh, what physics should do in the future. Now my last slide is controversial stuff. As you know, I uh, believe in controversial ideas, I'm the resident heretic here. In fact, many things normally considered absurd come out naturally in this picture. So I'll just list these and how it would happen. Uh, one of these things absurd to some people, except those for whom it isn't absurd, paranormal phenomena. Uh, well, that's merely coordination. You coordinate with the object you're fascinated, you're try trying to influence a person or an object. You learn how to create enough coordination that you can do things with it. It comes out naturally. Interesting thing is intelligent design is the most theoretical thing. You can lose your job if people know you believe there's something to it. And yet the arguments against intelligent design are not awfully good. They say, well, we don't have to invoke design. But there aren't the numbers to show that we don't need to, to prove it, you don't need to invoke design. Okay, well, I've talked about uh, the world having, coming from expressing ideas, and there's a quote from Yard Lee, there's a symbolic man in mind, which is the idea of man, which had to be present somewhere hidden, an idea before man could appear. Well, it seems to be saying that the fact that evolution produced man isn't an accident, somewhere there was an idea, in the background and uh, there were, this was combined with the questions of how might, you might bring into existence and that is influencing the course of evolution. So perfectly reasonable, just that people are very hostile to it. Finally, an equally convert, controversial idea, memory of what and homeopathy. Uh, if articulation or signs play a fundamental role in nature. This could be important in biology. Um, in fact, yeah, the Berridge, his work was in fact about how a certain kind of activity did things in biology. Uh, people don't like uh, homeopathic remedies because they say water cannot uh, be activated in this way. The arguments against it prove irrational. So in other words, this um, all has, uh, uh, this can say things about not only controversial science, but, but um, various kinds of heresies. 
Okay, so I think I'll leave Anne open it up to discussion. That's the end. In case you're interested in that, uh, just want to see that video I took. It's called The Sun Sparkles in Lunar Day.